Thank you. So um, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about a group of um, distinct um, actors, the, the Chinese construction and engineering firms, which I believe are the key actors driving a lot of the processes that we've been talking about. And, and also, I would like to, by this paper, I would like to, the motivation for me to do this research is I hope to convince people that um, uh, we need to focus more on this group of actors because we have heard a lot of uh, research on the development finance and the financiers. But without looking into this particular group of actors, the companies, I think we are missing a key piece in the puzzle. Um, and also, just before I present, uh, start my presentation, just a, a note on how I did this research. Though I haven't been able to interview um, any of the, the company people, this research is based on reviews of primary Chinese language sources, including industry journals, official yearbooks, academic journals, and government documents. And, and I also have been following the social media <laughs> publications of the uh, observers of the international contracting sector to get a sense of what What's going on in this industry? So I was trying, trying to piece out together the trajectory of development of this group of companies in their attempt to understand how they achieve their position today in China's global economic engagement. So first of all, I think it just goes through quickly go through some of my um, key arguments. Um, so as in the title, I coined the term aid contracting nexus to highlight the close relationship between China's foreign aid practice and the international contracting or 对外工程承包 business. Um, let me emphasize that the contracting here refers to the engineering and con construction contracting. And I argue that this group of companies dominated by state-owned enterprises especially a few central SOE national champions have been the main Okay, have been the main beneficiary of China's foreign aid that's dominated by, by turnkey projects or complete plant projects. And meanwhile, they have been very active in driving China's so-called official development finance or the loans we hear so much about that China extends to developing countries, which is often confused with China's official foreign aid, but should be better understood as China's export, uh, export ex promotion cr credit. And I'm also going to argue that this group of companies rose to such prominence as a result of the state's strategic instrument, instrumentalization of them as the vehicles for international, internationalizing China's heavy industry, exporting Chinese products, technology, and labor. <laughs> and today, they have formed a very well-organized and well-positioned interest group that will continue to shape China's engagement with the developmental, developing world. Um, just um, before I go into my analysis also, let me start with some graphs to get things into perspective. And this graph shows you the market share of Chinese international contracting firms in various regional markets. Uh, international contracting means the, business, uh, means the contracting business not in one's home country. And the data from, is from the US-based industry publisher Engineering News Record, or ENR, which surveys global interna international contracting firms annually and rank them, rank the top 225 or 250. By 2016, as you can see, um, there, uh, by 2016, there were about 64 Chinese group companies among the top 250. But because the Chinese groups are only, they only participate in the, um, in the survey as a, as a group company. So if you count into their subsidiaries, some, they, even the subsidiaries are easily among the top, 50, to top 250. So this 64 out of 250 actually an underestimate of China's share in this uh, global business. And so as shown in this graph, the, the, the brown dashed line is China's mark, overall market share in the international contracting markets. By 2016, China's share was over 20% from only about 7% in 2002. And the red line, of course, is in, is in Africa. China is the, leading, is the leading position in Africa, where by 2016, over half of the international contracting business has gone to Chinese firms. And the blue line there is in Asia, um, China now is about 30% of the market share. And also China is, in, is leading in Middle East and Latin America or in Caribbean as a close second. Okay. 
And also, I would like to has highlight that overseas contracting is a more important form of China's going out, actually even more important than FDI, which many economists tend to focus on. And according to the Ministry of Commerce, um, overseas contracting um, in terms of both new con new newly signed contracts and the completion have both led FDI by a good margin over the years, until quite recently, until 2015 or 16. And the difference between the, the F, between FTI and over, overseas contracting is also that whereas the FDI t flows t uh, usually tends to flow to more developed countries, U.S., European, Un Europe, or uh, Australia, often driven by large M&A deals. But the uh, um, the largest destination of overseas contracting are all developing countries, uh, which is not surprising. Um, moreover, more than FDI, which um, include so, so unlike, also unlike FDI, a lot of it is M&A um, um, deals. Um, I would say overseas contracting represents a more important form in terms of fixed capital, fixed assets formation, because it's just um, the building things from scratch. Um, so now let me get to the, the, the aid contracting nexus. Um, the story really traces back to China's foreign aid practice during Mao's time. The form of um, turnkey projects aid date, dates back to the 1950s, when China was an active participant of a non-alignment movement in which context China started to send aid to Africa. And in order to help African countries to develop their productive capacities, aid mostly took the form of complete plant. Um, such as sugar mills, textile factories, and so on. And of course, we, heard, we just heard about the Tanzania Zambia Railway. And such aid projects were often built for free or based on interest free loans, which was very costly for China, considering how poor China was at that time. And during the Cultural Revolution, China spent as much as close to 6% of its government expenditure on foreign aid. And, and usually these um, <coughs> complete plant or turnkey projects were delivered by dedicated units in, in China's line ministries. So when China embarked on the reform and opened up in the late 70s, these foreign aid units were turned into state-owned enterprises. So just give, me, uh, just give us a few examples of these um, in companies that uh, whose predecessors were, were actually in, in foreign aid business. So, for example, China State State Construction Engineering Corporation was the foreign aid arm of Ministry of Construction and Engineering. China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation was the, the foreign aid arm of the of Ministry of Railway. China Road and Bridge Corporation was the foreign aid arm of Ministry of Transportation. And finally, China National Complete Plant Export Corporation was the was the entity that was set up specifically to manage the complete plant aid, aid during that time, and so these companies then were um, because China started um, economic reform. These, these companies were encouraged to go into international contracting business, given their prior experience in delivering foreign aid projects in the developing world, and they enjoyed very quick successes. For example, in by by 1983, nearly four or five years into the reform period, China already signed over a thousand overseas contracts valued over two billion US dollars in 57 countries or regions. And by 1999, there were already 30 Chinese companies that made it into the top 250 international contractors, with the, the number one, the CSCEC, ranked in the 24th place, which was really not bad. And this was largely due to the um, favorable structural conditions in global economy in, in the 1980s because, um, because of the, the 1979 oil shock benefited many oil producing countries in the Middle East and North America, uh, created, which created strong purchasing power for infrastructure projects in these countries. And the companies also benefited from the goodwill that China earned through the foreign aid pro projects earlier. So I'm quoting one um, official here. Um, so this official wrote in the annual yearbook of China's foreign um, economic relations, he wrote that such remarkable achievements would not have been possible without help and support from many friendly country 
government officials and foreign friends. Some projects were won not through public tendering, but because the host countries or relevant entities granted our companies through negotiation out of friendship and trust in our country. And so as we heard this morning from Junda, the policy banks played a very important role in China's overseas expansion in this sector. And so SM Bank, um, uh, Export Import Bank of China, really played a critical role in this process. So two things happened in, in 1990s. The, um, one is the establishment of Exim Bank in 1994. Um, the other is the foreign aid reform. That's a major aid reform in, in China in 1995. Um, in this reform, China adopted the uh, con concessional loan as the main mode of aid, moving away from the previous practices, mainly based on grants and zero interest loans. And as you can see, according to the for uh, on the on the graph, um, the, according to the Ch white paper on China's foreign aid, uh, China has only published two white paper, official white paper on foreign aid in 2011 and 14, respectively. And you can see that concessional loans are becoming uh, increasingly the, the major form of foreign aid, um, surpassing grants and interest-free loans. And, and the difference between zero interest loan or interest-free loans and con so-called concessional loans are also that um, the zero interest loans are allocated from the government's budget, while concessional loans are to be raised from the financial market by the Exim Bank. Um, the, and the government merely needs to subsidize the gap between, between the financing cost and the, and the interest uh, repaid to the Exim Bank. So uh, again, I'm quoting a government official writing in the official uh, yearbook saying that the reform was to expand the scale of China's foreign aid as well as a, a source of funding to increase the efficiency of aid funds by using financial institutions as implementation organizations of concessional loans and to facilitate cooperation between Chinese and recipient country companies where the Chinese side can provide equip, uh, equipment and technology. And 10 years later, another major innovation came in 2004 with the creation of preferential buyer's credit. And according to an internal presentation by Exim Bank staff, this export credit with favorite terms, this is the export credit with favorite terms to support, I quote, to support the state's political and diplomatic needs and to promote economic cooperation with key countries and regions. So in practice, this preferential bias credit is often grouped together with the government concessional, lo concessional loans, which is part of the foreign aid as the two favorable loans, or in Chinese, liang yo, which is, uh, which is what causes a lot of confusion over the scale of China's foreign aid. Because the English language reports usually do not distinguish preferential buyer's credit and government concessional loans, but simply refer to them as concessional loans and treat them as China's foreign aid. However, only the government concessional loan facility is part of China's for official foreign aid. Um, but of course, both government concessional loan and preferential buyer's credit serve diplomatic purposes. But the difference is also that preferential buyer's credit also explicitly serves to promote China's export. Um, and the two are also technically different because the government concessional loan is issued in RMB while the preferential buyer's credit is issued in USD. But I would say the outside world can hardly be blamed for, complain, for conflating the two because both facilities are administered by the same concessional loan department within the SM Bank, which routinely refers to the two facilities together as a group, Liang Yo, and making them even more difficult to dis distinguish. And more importantly, from the perspective of the Chinese companies, there's no need to distinguish the two facilities because they both are used to finance their exports, and they often mix them up if it serves their needs. Because in, in the international <coughs> contracting projects, the companies do need, to use, do need to purchase from both China and from the host countries. So they would need, it serves them well to have, both, to have loans in, in both RMB and in US dollar. And 
also it is the Chinese companies to be building the projects as contractors that drive the borrowing process, even though the techni technical borrower, borrower of these loans is actually the host, host government. And so the companies uh, would coordinate between the two governments for the necessary intergovernmental framework agreements, submission of loan requests to Exim Bank, and so on. So according to a, a person who has substantial experience obtaining Liang Yu loans from Exim Bank, he wrote in the industrial journal, in the industry journal, he wrote that um, contractors play important roles in driving the projects. Co contractors not only communicate with the Ministry of Commerce from Ch in China and the Asian Bank in order to understand China's policy support or credit allocation for the host country, they also need to communicate with government agency in the host country and provide technical support for them when necessary. So as a result, the, this government-to-government -government loan model has become a major form of financing for Chinese contractors as they engage in this engineering, procurement, construction, or EPC projects overseas. And the demand for Liang Yu loans was were very strong. According to Li Ruogu, the former president of Exim Bank, Liang Yu loans sold over 30% annually uh, between 2005 and 2013. Just get this. So then come to my concept of eight contracting nexus. I, I, uh, this nexus emerged as a result of this. And constituting this nexus are the hundreds of construction and engineering firms active in international contracting, mostly state-owned and dominated by a few national champions. And foreign aid in, a, in the form of turnkey projects gave rise to China's in, international contracting sector. And aid projects also serve as water testing pilots for Chinese companies to enter new markets in the devel developing world as the government's policy, a political auspicious, help shelter them from difficulties. And this, this nexus revolves around the policy space of China's gov Chinese government's economic diplomacy that makes China's foreign aid money with, the, with provincial buyer's credit as well as other sources of finance um, to secure construction co contracts across the developing countries. And the Chinese state financial institutions are mandated to support infrastructure projects both for economic diplomacy and for promoting Chinese export. And so why do, how did this aid contracting business rise to such a prominent, prominent position? I argue that they were recognized by the state as the key instrument for internationalizing Chinese economy, especially the heavy industry. So over, overseas contracting helps sending exports of, of products, labor, and technology abroad. The more capital intensive export as part of um, China's development strategy Rather, other than the light industry, the, the, the usual labor intensive industry export that uh, we, we have talked, we have, we usually talk, focus on. And, and also, we could see that the reviewing the, the, the policy discussions, we could see that a targeted industrial policy regarding how this contracting industry should be developed was already evident by the early 1990s. But as China was preparing to join the WTO in the, in the late 1990s, it was, recognized a crit, it was recognized as a critical vehicle. And let me read this quote from uh, an official directive issued by, okay, try to click here. So this was a, a directory issued in 2000, 2000 by several ministries that were responsible for China's economic affairs. So it was said, all regions and all, doc, all government organs must fully recognize the importance of developing international contracting from a political height and an understanding of the big picture. Make sure to develop international contract, contracting as an important measure to implement the central government's going out strategy. I'll skip the rest. I think it's uh, enough. To... And lastly, I would like to also talk about the eight contracting nurses emerging uh, as an interest group. Um, they have really um, effectively organized themselves into a powerful interest group, which is a coalition of these engineering construction firms, the manufacturers of machineries and materials whose export rely on the on international contracting, and the agencies that organized labor to work in Chinese projects overseas. And 
this industry is really uh, well organized. They have a national association called the China International Contractors Association, or CHINCA. And it was established in 1988, now has over 1,500 members. And steering the association are 43 of China's largest construction uh, companies, uh, virtually all state-owned. And, and also, th they, they, are active, um, they are actively engaged in, in, in a range of activities to advance the development of the industry, including collecting intelligence about the markets, conducting research, training conferences, and setting industry regulations, and so on. And rather than uh, an autonomous association of the contracting firms, these organizations are better understood as semi-official semi bodies coordinating government industry relations, and the leadership positions are typically occupied by current or retired officials from the Ministry of Commerce. And this assures that on the one hand, the association has easy access when lobbying for policy support, and that the government has direct influence over the various activities that the association are engaged in. Um, and looking ahead, I think um, the now the because the, the the traditional EPC model that has been driven the industry's phenomenal growth is in the past decades is coming to an end. This is due to a number of structural reasons: the intense competition among Chinese firms, also the rising labor costs in China, and the shrinking space for in, in developing countries to uh, to borrow from China. Um, so, in response, this industry is seeking to. Sorry. This industry is seeking to transform themselves from the mere builders to the role of developer. This means that the contracting firms will seek to get involved in the planning, design, and initiation of new projects rather than simply bidding for existing ones, um, as well as going into operation of the projects after they have been built. So in other words, they seek to expand both to the front and the back ends of the value chain. And the catchphrase being used in this industry is um, integrated investment construction operation, Hua. And an example of this is the Addis Ababa Djibouti rail line, uh, where the Chinese contractors not only were involved in the construction, but also uh, undertook the pre-construction design and post-construction operation. And the, the project also used Chinese manufactured locomotives and applied Chinese technical standards. Um, also, besides use, utilizing Exim Bank's concessional loans, the main contractor, China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, also invested with its own funds. So, and also they are they also investing uh, along the rail line uh, in the real estate to boost the commercial value of the of the railway. So, this model of whole value chain going out is is supposed to be the template for other contracting firms to follow in their future international oper operations. Okay, coming to my conclusion, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just save it for the later discussion. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.